right, let's get started today. Um, so for those that I don't know, haven't seen, so the first homework assignment is up on the website. Um, so assignment one, I have to make this bigger because this is a crazy high uh, screen. Okay, so assignment one is going to be due in two weeks before midnight. Uh, the first part is incredibly easy. You should have already done this. Uh, it should be the easiest 10 points you get in this class. Sign up for the mailing list. Hey, <laughs> 10 points. All right. Okay, so the other parts are intended to uh, help you go through some of the stuff we've talked about in class, to reinforce some concepts, to uh, make sure you have the skills necessary to be successful in this class. So the first part is you're going to make a program that emulates some of the functionality of the Morris worm. So, um, so it is not the propagation. So the key part of the propagation of the Morris worm, right, was a that it had. Um, you know, it had remote code exploitation in SendMail and the finger daemon, but it also leveraged the trust between hosts on the network, right? So it would look for trusted hosts in the network and then use to try to leverage that trust in between them to propagate itself. Uh, so you're going to write a program that actually does this, uh, this discovery or tries to identify these trust issues in a ho on a host. Um, so when your program's run, it's going to basically output a list of all the host names known and that are possibly trusted by the currently executing host. So it'll be a single executable called discovery. Uh, the, the interface is very simple. You're going to run it and it's going to look in the locations we've specified to look for new hosts, uh, new and potentially trusted hosts. And you're going to output it one per line. Uh, the order doesn't matter. Uh, and note that we're specifically looking for host names because I think uh, not IP addresses. So host names, I, in my mind, they're a little bit more likely to be trusted, right, if you've given them a name rather than just an IP address. Okay, so here's the four places you'll be looking. ETC hosts, uh, SSH configs, authorized keys, and known hosts. So how do you know how to extract host information from these files? Using set or layer. Yeah, but how do you know what to set or grep or off? We look into those and see the formatting. Yeah, so you look, not I would even say not exactly in the files themselves, right? But you look into the documentation. Okay. Right, so this is exactly why I provided links here to all these things, right? Hmm. What is the format, what does the specification say a host's file should look like? What are the host names in the host file? Um, so you'll have to write parsers for each of these things to parse and extract the relevant information from each of these file formats. So other things to do, right? So here we want to get the SSH config for each user. Why do we want to do it for each user? Yeah, we want to get as many, we want to try and find as many things as possible to try and find as many potentially trusted hosts. How do you find out all the users on the system? Flash users. Hmm? Flash users, are they always going to be in there? No. You can look in like EDC password and yeah, you should look at the ETC password, password file, right, to see the users, two. and then you can see the home directory for all the users from there, and use that information to then find everybody's config file, <laughs> authorized key, and node host file. So, uh, I mean, kind of debated even putting this line in there, but I guess it's better to be explicit, right? Uh, you must handle permissions correctly. Your program should not crash just because it can't access a certain user's SSH config file, right? So you should. Um, you know, this is about, you're trying to write a worm, right? You don't want your worm to crash. You want it to run undetected and be very stealthy, right? So crashes attract, uh, attract attention. So we want to have as few crashes as possible. Questions on the goal of this part? Yes. 
So by uh, handling the permission, you mean the permission that have been set in like PDC password size? Yeah, exactly. So um, I just mean handle permissions correctly as in doesn't crash when you can't read a file or something, right? Um, or don't have permissions in a directory to read that directory. Um, so that's up to you to make sure that your program is robust. Because these are things we're going to check for. OK. But the, you know, there's a lot of different operating systems out there. So it could be you know, BSD may do things differently than Linux, which may do things differently than, I don't know, any other Unix derivative. Uh, so we're going to standardize on Ubuntu 14.04 64-bit. So this is going to be our test system and our environment for this, these assignments and all other assignments and hacking exercises in the course. So, um, you know, if you don't have access to one right now, you should set up a virtual machine to be able to test and develop these things. So, um, programming languages, I don't really care what language you write this program in, it can be in whatever you want. Um, your uh, programs will run on a default version of Ubuntu 14.04 64-bit with the default packages installed. Um, this is a little bit about if you want to use additional packages that aren't installed by default, like let's say you want to write a Haskell program, which would be really cool if somebody wants to do that, I fully support that. Um, then you need to include the uh, GHC, the Haskell compiler, in your packages file. And the submission system will automatically install these packages for you um, before it runs and tests your program. Mm -hmm. uh, you also, so submissions instructions. So you need to submit your code. You'll need to submit a make file and a readme. So the readme is very simple. It should just contain your name, your ASU ID, and a description of how your program works, right? Kind of simple standard for courses. Um, the make file, so who has experience with make files? Everyone who doesn't is, I guess, the opposite of that. Yeah, who doesn't have experience with make files? All right, cool, so you're gonna learn stuff in this course. Awesome. All right, so I've tasked Sai with uh, finding some resources, so we'll put resources on here for links to learn about make files. Um, just a series of steps about how to compile your program. At the re end result, you should have an executable file called discovery, whether that's an actual executable file or a shell script that executes your file correctly, whatever, it doesn't really matter as long as it works. So this is the interface that you have to specify, right? So what we're gonna do to test it is we're gonna set up the environment in certain ways, run your program, and compare what you output with what we expect in the host that we specifically put in, in that testing environment. Questions on the first part? Yeah. Yes. Uh, how are we gonna populate those? Because we're gonna install a clean version of all virtual machines to do this assignment, right? Mm -hmm. Probably those, uh, what's called, those files are not populated, so yeah. we need to populate them, right? So how do you test your software? I need to populate some files. Yeah, you already test cases, right? So part of that is under, so that actually helps you know that your program's correct because you know that you can write test cases that test various things. You can say, put a host file uh, in EPC host, you can put host names there, make sure your program correctly detects those, then you can put additional host names with other uh, optional host name fields in there, right, to test that. So. You know, this will be, be good for you to test that. You will have, uh, it's not set up yet. Hopefully by Wednesday I'll have it all set up. Um, but there will be an online submission system so you'll be able to submit and then get feedback about what test cases you're passing and not passing. And you'll know right away exactly what your grade is. So um, that should help. Mm -hmm. It would be a yeah. one-time submission or? What's that? It would be a one-time submission or you can submit it as many times. Uh, definitely not one time. I don't know. I, uh, I'm willing to entertain thoughts or arguments. The problem is, is I don't want people to just use this as a testing oracle, right? And just submit, make one code change, submit, make a code change, submit, make a code change, submit. Uh, this happens. Like, I mean, you know, not that, not to disparage any of you, good people, um, but people in previous classes have done that. So you know, and this, 
we have machines that are constantly compiling, testing, all that kind of stuff. So if the queue fills up with all your submissions, then other people, if there's a delay between when they submit, right, then we have a problem. Um, I'm probably willing with giving a limit, but a higher limit, like maybe 10 or 15 submissions, something like that, because I think that would be reasonable. Um, because that'll get, and I will, the other thing I'll definitely do is I'll let you do an unlimited number of smoke tests, which just um, submit and compile to make sure it actually compiles correctly. Because um, that's a key thing, right? So you don't want to burn your submissions by, if you want the submissions to test the actual functionality, not just if your thing doesn't compile because your make file didn't make the file executable or something like that. I think there's other questions over here. Yeah. So the second part of the, your, the last, I guess last part, I think of it as the second part because sign up for the mailing list is, you should be doing that already. Okay, the idea is you're a hacker when you break into a system, right? So you use certain vulnerabilities to get in, but you know, if you wanna come back to that system at a later point in time, you maybe don't wanna re-exploit those same vulnerabilities over and over because what if they update the operating system or what if I don't know, maybe that's more noisy and they're more likely to be discovered. Uh, so you're gonna be creating a web server in quotes. Um, so this will be a real web server, so you'll implement uh, the minimal amount of functionality for the HTTP 1.1 uh, spec. But it'll be, it, this web server will actually be a backdoor that will allow you to execute commands remotely on that machine. So why are, why are web servers really good as backdoors? Uh, the ports are really popular. Yeah. yeah, port 80, what are the ports? 80 and 443 is HTTPS, right? So almost every firewall in existence will allow access to or from those ports uh, because you know web traffic makes up the bulk of the volume of traffic, right? So, uh, so yeah, that's definitely one reason or some other reasons. I mean, I guess they're all kind of related, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, if the network administrator is looking at traffic and they see a bunch of connections on a weird port, like, I don't know, 1337 or something like that, right? Like that's very suspicious and you're gonna look at that very closely to understand what's going on. If I see port 80, port 43 traffic, mm, no. yeah, whatever. And there's a lot of content that can be over there, right? Like streaming services, all kinds of things use HTTP, so they may not even look uh, very closely at the traffic. So uh, that's the idea. So yeah, this, it's not gonna raise any red flags to any administrators, and it's gonna, you know, can use very dedicated, very simple ports. Okay, so what you're gonna do is create an HTTP 1.1 server. Uh, you'll have to, to do this, you'll have to look at the, and read the RFC. So why is reading RFCs important to this class? You have to develop how yeah, they work. Yeah, so you have to, well, understand how what works. How the, the protocol is implemented. Yeah, so oftentimes the best resource for something, like you want to learn more about IP, or you want to learn more about DNS. Uh, yeah, you can read the Wikipedia page, but if you read this spec, you'll understand much more in depth about the spec. So what, what's the point of RFC? define a proper protocol and interface to do this, otherwise we're not going to be able to write software that uh, communicates and interoperates correctly. 
so you can, so part of the goal is to read this, and yes, it's an incredibly long document, right? It describes all of HTTP, but it's from, you know, 1999. Um, so part of the goal is, right, to go through here and understand, okay, what's relevant? What do I actually, what do I have to implement, and what's optional? Because you don't need to do the optional thing, but you need to create the things that are necessary. So why is that critical for our back door? Because you need the packets to look the same as the web traffic. Which yeah, you want the web traffic should look the same, right? The HTTP protocol that it's speaking should look the same. If an administrator decides to make a web request to the server, right, it should get a legitimate response back. It shouldn't get a response that says, I don't know, it shouldn't throw an error in Chrome that says, hey, this thing isn't speaking the right HTTP protocol, mm -hmm. right? Because that will also raise red flags. So you're trying to blend in as much as possible. Um, and the other goal of this assignment is to get you familiar with network programming. So uh, in, that, in light of that, no HTTP libraries are allowed. Um, so you'll have to do the actual sockets and read from a socket input, and you'll have to parse the header, the HTTP headers and the HTTP request based on the spec. Uh, by hand, but you can use URL parsing libraries, so I'll give you that. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so we can use sockets. Okay. You sh yes, you absolutely should. I mean, uh, how else? Uh, how else would you? Do I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how else you'd <laughs> do it. Right. Sure. How are we gonna? How will you guys keep the sockets from bumping into each other? From yes, there? you don't need to worry about that. So. That's, so the, um, and the name of your backdoor program will be normal web server, very innocuous. Name. <laughs> uh, so the interface will be, you know, normal web server, and we give you a port on the command line, and you'll have to listen to that port. So, yeah, well, if this port's already used, what should you do? Stop and die correctly, right? You shouldn't just crash. Yeah. Um, How about kill the thing running on the port? No. <laughs> Very too, too evil, too evil. Don't kill the thing that's running on that port and then try to connect to the socket. <laughs> um, yes, we're not gonna do that. Uh, so your goal is you're gonna listen for incoming connections on the port and for every incoming connection, you're gonna respond uh, to most of the requests with a valid HTTP 1.1 response with the 404 HTTP response code. So this is gonna be your default thing when people connect to you, you're gonna say, hey, I don't know what you're looking for. <laughs> Um, but it will be a valid 404 response that will show up and the browsers will parse it correctly. And this is another key point that I want to emphasize. Um, so this should be regardless of whatever they request from you. So when somebody makes an HTTP request, they can send you additional data um, if they're doing a post request or mm -hmm. any kind of, of stuff. So you have to follow the spec and make sure you're parsing all of the input bytes from that connection, right? Even if you're not gonna do anything with them, you still need to make sure you're parsing everything. Otherwise, the client's gonna hang because it sent data to the server that it never acknowledged. Uh, so it's not gonna know it's, it can read things. Um, so yeah, this, this is the key point. So this is why you're implementing the spec correctly, why you're gonna follow the spec, because you need to be able to uh, not, not cause any problems to the client. The client should not know that you're using this other weird web server, right? We should just think it's a normal Apache web server or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now the backdoor functionality. So when you receive a GET request, an HTTP GET request, in the form, for a URL of the form slash exec slash bracket command. So what do I mean here by bracket command? So what's bracket command? The command that you want to run on. Yeah, the it's server. a placeholder, right? It's yeah. a placeholder. It means the, whatever is sent there in the URL from that second slash to the end of the string, uh, you're gonna take that command and execute it in whatever the, oops, uh, whatever it is the equivalent of the uh, system Linux, that's weird, Linux syscall. Um, so you can look at this to see exactly what it is to make sure that what you're using actually corresponds with what I mean here. So it should be the same as running the command with bin, uh, bin sh, sh, that's bash c. Uh, so this means that the command will use the current path, it will, oh, uh, it'll use the current path, it will pass all arguments correctly, and it will do all the space parsing and everything for you. So you don't have to worry about that from the outside. Right, you want this to be easy for yourself. Okay, 
So after you execute it, the HTTP response will be the standard out of the executed command, right? We're executing something on the server, we want to get that response back. And the status code should be 200. Um, and there's no limitation, well, yeah, no, there should be no limitations to the characters that are in command. Isn't there a limit to how long the URL should be, though? Yes, yeah. I mean, yeah. besides those type of things. Yeah, okay. Yes. Besides something that's specified in the spec, right? It's the valid HTTP request with a valid URL in there, and you need to, you need to execute that. Um, okay, for instance, if you're, you know, if I make a get request to exec slash ls, you're gonna return whatever executing ls is on the server, you're gonna output that. Or if I make an HTTP get request of exec ls space la, then I wanna return the body of the, oh, I didn't finish my thought here. But it follows up here, the body, uh, output of the execution of the ls dash la command on the server. Uh, what is supposed to be the working <laughs> yeah. uh, Whatever the working, whatever it is when you start your program. So would that be actually slash exec with the space or the percent 20? That's a good point. Um, yeah. You'll have to follow the HTTP spec. I believe you'll have to decode the URL yeah. so it will translate percent 20 into space or space. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or plus, yes, plus as well. So you should use a library for that. So you know it's right, you don't have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. But if there are spaces in there, it should work too, right? Yeah. This is for you. This is your own functionality, right? You want it to be as easy as possible to use. All right. And then when the server's killed, you have to clean up correctly. This just means you're going to be a good software developer, right? When you we kill the program, you're going to release all your resources, release the socket, and then uh, safely terminate. Any questions? Or you get a SIG in, but the same thing. Control C sends a signal to the program. So. Cool. Uh, same thing here. Got to be Ubuntu 1404 64 bit. Um, same thing with packages. This is all the same stuff. Psy uh, did find some good network. If you haven't programmed, if you have little experience with network programming, um, there's good resources here. If you find other resources that are good, email the list or email me and I'll add it. I'll add it here, right? I think it's helpful if we have a collection of these resources. Like, I think that's totally uh, good. Uh, cool. Okay, so uh, you can earn a little bit of extra credit in part three if you implement gzip encoding. Uh, but note that you'll have to, once again, go to the spec and learn when can I actually send a gzip response from the server. Right, the client, not all clients may support gzip, right? So there's a mechanism, uh, a little bit of a negotiation where the client says, hey, I accept gzip encoding, and then that's when you can gzip the encoding. Uh, so this should work transparently to a web browser when you access this. And obviously only on the, I mean, you can do it for all of them, I guess it doesn't matter. And the submission site will be set up shortly, and you'll get an announcement about that. So any questions on the assignment? So we have one more topic to talk about. Um, so we talked about ethics. We talked about when we hire a hacker. Um, and so uh, 
Uh, the other thing I want to briefly touch on is an aspect of legal hacking, which is pretty awesome, and that's penetration testing. Uh, so penetration testing is when a company hires you to break into their systems, and they purposefully are doing this so that you can attempt to find possible flaws in their system. Uh, so the idea is, it's not just finding vulnerabilities, right? So just vulnerability analysis is finding vulnerabilities, right? So that on its own, in a penetration testing sense, is not enough. Why? Because certain vulnerabilities might be very hard to exploit and might never be exploitable in the real world. Yeah, so this company is hiring you, they're hiring you specifically to demonstrate security flaws in their system, right? So they want to see that you can, act, like what damage you could actually do, not what damage you could theoretically do given whatever vulnerabilities you potentially found, right? And exploitation is the proof of, yeah, I found a vulnerability and look, you hired me and I got root on your dev servers, I got root in your database, I have all your customer uh, records, like, you know, these are really bad things. Um, it's usually done in a black box manner. What does black box mean in this case? Yeah. Yeah, so you, don't, you have no knowledge of the source code or how it works, right? You're operating under the same capabilities of a bad guy, right, or a malicious hacker. You're on the outside. Uh, black box is also in quotes here because oftentimes, you know, if you're uh, targeting, let's say, a bank, or a credit card processor, right? They, you may need user accounts to get access to more functionality. So often they'll supply that to you. So, but you'll do multiple types of pen testing where you say, okay, what can I do without any account, right? Which would be really bad. And then what can I do if I have an account on the system? Am I able to gain privilege or move horizontally? Uh, something like that. So is this enough? Is this all, so if you're the head of an organization, you just, you hire a bunch of hackers to bang on your stuff and you fix whatever they tell you, and then you're like, yeah, we're secure. <laughs> no. Because, no, why? Because one of the hackers might find a vulnerability which he might choose not to disclose and Ooh. later use it for his purpose. That's tricky. Let's say you're dealing with, let's say this company has really good Yelp reviews, paraphrase, right? <laughs> very good trust, like you trust this company. They're going to, you know, they're going to tell you about all the things that they find. Is that still enough? Are you secure? develop secure software? The technology you use might have certain vulnerabilities which are discovered at a later point in time. I mean, you never know. What happens when they tell you, when you get a report that says we found a vulnerability, what does that mean? There is a known exploit. Yeah, they found a vulnerability. What does that say about the rest of your system? Might have yeah, it doesn't say anything, right? I mean, if they're good, they probably tried a lot of other areas, and these were the things that they were able to find. But there's absolutely no guarantee that these are all of the vulnerabilities that actually exist in your system, right? There could be other vulnerabilities that maybe they couldn't exploit that they thought were unexploitable. There could be uh, just it could be outside their area of expertise. It could be something they're not looking for. It could be something that's a vulnerability at a later date. Maybe somebody finds a vulnerability at a later point. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, but so is it good, is it useless with what I just said? Should we like never hire penetration tests for our systems? They don't show us anything. Yeah, so like, so like the whole stack uh, can be found, and uh, like you 
test team to test your system and then you go to your bosses and say hey look these people were able to get into our systems look they hacked the bank accounts of our customers or they were able to you know if they found this who knows what other kind of stuff were out there right so even if you can't necessarily gain or claim anything right it's still a valid and useful technique to try to increase the assurance of our systems that they are secure um, so yeah it's not Definitely not a good way to ensure the security of a system, right? So it's not it doesn't mean that your system is secure. Um, you get to take into all kinds of other aspects. You can do static analysis, you look at the policy, you look at social engineering attacks, all this kind of stuff uh, make up uh, a whole security approach. So anyways, we already had this discussion of is penetration testing ethic, uh, is useful. So in this class, proceed ethically, right? So. Uh, only attempt to find vulnerabilities in web applications and systems that you control, have permission, don't go to jail, uh, don't violate ASU's policy either. That's also very important when you're doing these things. All right, any questions on this before ethics? Very important. Sweet. All right. Now we're going to move a little bit. So the first topic we're going to cover is we're going to talk about the network. Um, so specifically we're going to focus on attacks on the network that we as an attacker can leverage in order to try to migrate to other hosts. Um, and so we're not gonna go, well, we'll go into depth about certain things, but there are lots of other classes here. There's a whole advanced network security class. Um, so we're not trying to step on those things, but we wanna go over and discuss what are the important things here. So, uh, you know, I expect that you have some network, networking experience background and or you will gain some through the assignment. So I'm going to cover these a little bit quickly, um, but you know, feel like stop me at any point. We should, you know, I do want to have some discussions at certain points. So what's the IP? What are, what's the IP? Uh, so the Internet Protocol Suite is a set of protocols. So it's the whole idea is we want to transport data between two nodes in a network, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be the internet, but um, it could be any nodes in any network, right? The internet is separate from the IP suite. Uh, it's also known as the TCP IP stack. And this is because there's a kind of a tight coupling between TCP and IP, or they're, they're very closely related. Uh, the whole idea is that we take the network and we want to abstract different layers from it, right? So each layer and each technology focuses on one particular thing and abstracts all the other details from below it. So for instance, the link protocols. So what are some examples of link protocols? What do we mean by link here? Like the guy on Zelda? <laughs> connecting two nodes. What was it? Connecting two nodes. Connecting two nodes, yeah. Like the physical link, right, that connects two nodes in a network. Or not necessarily nodes, it could be intermediary nodes, right? Um, what are some examples of link protocols? OSPF is network layer, I guess. Okay, that may be a little bit higher up. What, what's the, how's your phone talk to your wireless router? Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. No. Wi-Fi. Yeah, 802.11n yeah. or whatever the thing is, or A or G or B, or an Ethernet cord, right? Mm -hmm. Plug in an Ethernet cord. That's there's an Ethernet protocol of how one end of the cord talks to the other end of the cord, right? Um, 
Above that, we have the IP, the internet protocols that we'll look at. Above that, so the internet protocols deal with routing. How do we get data from one host to the other? Uh, above that, we have the transport protocols. So how, do, how does one host send data to another host? Right? At this point, we don't care how the data gets there. I don't care if you put it on a ship in USB keys and then it took a month to get there. Uh, you know, we don't really care about that because we're abstracting how it physically gets there. Um, and finally, we have where we actually want to be is in the applications, right? So you, the programmer, and especially the user, you don't want to think about TCP packets and strings and connections, right? I mean, you're going to think about that as a developer because you want to build applications on top of that that use these abstractions. The whole point is that you don't, when you're a programmer, you don't have to worry about the link level, right? And think about, okay, is this person connected by Ethernet or Wi-Fi? Obviously, in some cases with like mobile phones, you actually do want to know that information, right? But in general, if I just want to send data from one computer to the other, I don't care how it gets there, how the other layers work, as long as I can successfully do that. So to think about this as a layer, a layering system, right, from the bottom, we have the physical layer, which is communicating from one node to the next. Uh, above that, we have the link layer, so this, um, gets into hardware interfaces, uh, which interacts with the internet layer, which is IP, um, then above that, the transport layer, and then finally on top of that, we have the applications that we all know and love, right? <laughs> HTTP, SMTP, what's SMTP? <laughs> yeah, email protocol, DNS. The domain name, yeah, so that's the thing that takes that domain name you type into the browser and turns it into an IP address so that you can actually make the second layer work. Um, NFS, network file share, yeah, so this is a file sharing, uh, not, a, not like a file sharing protocol, but um, to allow people access to like a, like, a, what's the example I'm thinking of? Like on Windows, when you share share, like share folder. this folder with the network, that's yeah. NFS that it's yeah. using. Or if you're on Linux, I believe Samba is the SMB. Is that SMB? Or is that a different one? SMB. It's a different protocol. All right. Point is, there's a lot. Okay. So we're going to start with IP addresses um, because this is going to be very key to what we want to look at in the security here of the network. Um, so each host. You know, if you want to talk to a host on the network, it's got to have some kind of address that you can refer to it, right? Um, you think about like homes and houses. If you don't have an address, I can't write a piece of mail to get to you, right? Because there's no place for it to go. Um, you know, a host could have many IP addresses. It really doesn't matter. Um, IP addresses. So IPv4 is really what we're going to focus on because IPv6 adoption is not quite up where we want it to be yet to talk about it. Um, so IPv4 has 32 bits. Um, the classical way of thinking about it is a class, a net ID, and a host ID. Uh, and it's represented, hopefully, in what is this very familiar dotted decimal of notation, right? So each of these is 0 to 255, right, which is a byte. So you have 32 bits, so four bytes, right? And the classes used to be, when you got a network, it, you would get it in this space. So you would get uh, a class A network that had uh, a lot of hosts. I wish I had 16 million hosts on it. The class B network would have 65,000, and the class C network would have 256. Uh, what's the problem with hard coding the separation here between different networks? What's that? Say again, louder. Yeah, wastage of IP, yeah, waste IP addresses, right? Because as an organization, to get a network, right, or to get a slice of the IP network, you'd have to fall into one of these super broad buckets. So what would you want if you were starting a business? <laughs> Game of sleep with the Yeah, let's have one. Yeah, I want an A. Give me an A. Like, well, do you need 16 million hosts? Well, not now, but as a startup, I'm clearly going to grow to 16 million computers. Uh, so yeah, I definitely want an A. Um, so then what happened is they said, okay, doing this routing or thinking about it in terms of these classes really isn't that, you know, it's very limiting, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, okay. Um, 
So uh, this wastes enormous amount of space. Uh, the number of posts constantly increases. Uh, IPv6 has, is it 64-bit addresses or is it 128? 128-bit, yeah, a ton of addresses. So you can get ev give every organization 12 million or whatever IP addresses, and it's going to be fine. Yeah, they say that they can address each particle in the universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With 128-bit yeah. addresses, you can address what is it? Every particle of sand in the beach or something like that, right? Just in case they really want to get your data packets. Um, the problem is adoption is slow. So the numbers I looked at said Google says they're getting about I don't know, nine or ten percent uh, IPv6 traffic, which is actually pretty good. Uh, so at some point I'll have to update all this for IPv6, but today is not that day. Uh, so in 1983 they came up with a scheme called CIDR, which is classless interdomain routing. So the idea is um, you could change the net ID and host ID boundary to be on any bit between 13 and 27. So you could arbitrarily adjust the size of the network. So which gives you 32 hosts minimum to 224,000 hosts maximum. And so IP is really kind of the glue of the internet. So this is what gets your data from one place to the other, regardless of all the hops in between. So your data comes from us here to probably, what's the name of the ISP, is it ClearLink? No, I can't remember. Uh, yes, CenturyLink, yeah. So probably the CenturyLink servers, uh, then depending on where it wants to go, it may go to like a Verizon or an AT&T broadband, which then get made sent down to LA if your traffic's gonna go to LA and then to a data center there, right? So it, it gets all these hops. Uh, the important thing here, is that it's connectionless, so IP doesn't care about who you've connected with or what or the state of the connection, right? It's just concerned with, I want to get this piece of data from this machine with this address to this machine to with this other address. And that's all it ever cares about. Um, it's unreliable. What does that mean? The packet can be dropped off. Yeah, the packet could be dropped on the floor, right? We don't care. IP doesn't care, right? Anything could happen. Uh, Best effort, so which means they'll try to do it, which is actually, kind of, I guess, similar to Dr. Michael. Huh? Actually, in the book, it's, uh, I mean, it's mentioned that it makes no effort. The best effort is an euphemism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's best effort. <laughs> it's, it's optimistic, right? Yeah. Like, you know, it I mean, honestly, I mean, packets nowadays, yeah. fairly reliable, right? But <laughs> still, um, still, it doesn't offer anything. So, you know, delivery of a packet, the integrity, what does integrity mean of a packet? Changing, yeah, it could be lot, it could be changed along the way. Um, ordering, what does what does ordering mean? Yeah, right. So if I send two packets to you, one after the other. Who's to say you get them in that same order, right? Because we're not saying how uh, what path the route the packets take to the network or anything like that. Um, Non-duplication. You could get two of the same packet, right? I could send one packet to you and. Somewhere along the way, a router sends the packet, but then thinks it didn't send it, so it sends it again, right? And you get two packets at the host. Totally happens. Uh, bandwidth, there's no guarantee of bandwidth or anything. So the whole idea is what IP is for is to exchange what we call datagrams or packets or just information between any two nodes that have IP addresses. So do you all have? Is this how you talk to other computers on the network? Is you just you say, I know Google's IP address and they know my IP address, so you guys will exchange packets? Why not? It'd be hard to remember all those sets of numbers. It would be very hard to remember all sets of numbers, yeah, exactly. And the other problem is nowadays there's a lot of uh, networks in between you and Google, right? So uh, actually, I think ASU NAT, which I think we'll get into. Yeah, uh, which makes it seem like all of us are coming from the same, same IP address to Google. Which, if you've ever done a Google search and it says, I think you're a robot, fill in this captcha, yes. it's because all of your fellow students are searching for things on Google and it's so much that they think we're robots crawling Google, right? Um, but there still is 
we have a way to know Google's IP address. We have our own IP address, either on the network or internally within ASU. And when we send out that packet from here that says, hey, I want to talk to Google, send this thing to Google, the IP network knows how to get that packet there. And so this is where, so the other pr lower level protocols are how that packet actually physically gets from your computer to the next hop, so from here to the router. So RFC 791, right? So like I said, everything comes back to the RFCs. They're pretty awesome. Uh, it defines exactly the bits in an IP datagram and exactly what they mean. So do we actually care about what's in the data of the IP packet? No, not really, right? I mean, yeah, it might be encrypted. Who cares, right? We, I mean, we'll see. We care slightly, but, um, uh, but yeah, in ge the general case, we don't really care. So here we're talking about basically the header of an IP packet. So this is additional metadata we add on top of that packet that specifies, hey, where it's going to go. So if you think about, um, has somebody sent a letter, like a physical letter? Yeah. No. What? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm still going to use this anyway. So you've seen movies with people writing letters, right? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that old? Okay. Um, right, so your datagram in an, a letter equivalent would be what? The letter itself, right? I write a letter out to somebody, then I fold it up. So then what I do, I just throw that in the mail and be like, post office knows what to do and they know how to get this to who I want to. Exactly, so I put it in an envelope first, right? And then I write some metadata on the front that tells the post office how to take this letter, this data, from me to them, right? So that's exactly what's on here. So when I write um, on a letter, when I write, you know, the person's name, their, uh, their address, their, you know, their house number, their city, their state, their zip code, everything on the front, and I also put a return on their back, right? In case there's any problems, they can return it back to me. So I put my name, my address, all that stuff. This is all the same information. So you gotta think of this, this headers like the addresses you put on an envelope. Uh, so the first thing, the first four bytes are, or first four bits, sorry, are the version of the IP that we're using. So normally this will be what? Four, IPv4, unless it's IPv6, right? That's how you would know that this is an IPv6 packet. The HL, yeah, the header length. Okay, I forgot what that was. I was going to cheat and look, but you guys got it before me. That's what I should just do is say, what's HL stand for? <laughs> um, so HL is the length of the header, right? So this specifies um, how much, how far this packet goes down. Uh, we'll see in the next slide exactly how, what the properties of this are. Uh, but the idea is here, right? So this could be a very, as we know, so why do you have to include the length here? Because it could be with you. Exactly. So we now we know, okay, by including this here, that means the length of the header could be variable. Right? If it was fixed, we wouldn't need to include this. It would always be whatever, 20 bytes or I don't know, five words or something like that. Okay. After that we have some flags about the service type. So this uh, as we'll see specifies different flags. Um, then we have the total length of the entire packet. Of the entire packet, right, of the data that we're sending. Uh, we have an identifier. So this is an identifier that specifies uniquely the packet. Uh, we have flags for the packet. Uh, and fragmentation offsets, which get into really interesting and enable some really cool um, attacks. attacks here. Uh, a time to live, the protocol. So this protocol is actually does break a little bit of the encapsulation. So this is the protocol of the underlying packet. Is it TCP, UDP? ARP, ICMP, or uh, different kinds of protocol in there. Um, a checksum, so what's a checksum? To check the integrity of the packet. Exactly, to check the integrity of the header, right? So this yes. is make sure that when you're reading this, I know I got all of these bits correctly. Because every bit in here is important, so if one bit flips, everything is done. Uh, then we have the source IP address, the destination IP address, any other options, uh, a variable length option section, padding, and then finally the data. 
Uh, so let's break here, and when we come back, we'll dig into kind of exactly what these mean. So.